Leggett. I'm the executive director for Research Data Canada, and I'm going to be hosting a lot of the sections in our summit today. I'm just going to share my screen. All right. So, um, as I said, I'm Mark Leggett. I'm going to um, appear in the Zoom plenary room a fair amount, and I'll be popping in and out of uh, breakout rooms throughout the uh, the summit. Uh, the next three days. So I've just got a few kind of logistic and uh, some details to pass on. Uh, first of all, I would like to um, acknowledge that I'm uh, speaking to you today uh, from the unceded territory of the Abuwit Mi'kmaq First Nation in uh, Prince Edward Island. Um, I know that these uh, virtual events are always uh, a little bit different uh, for many of us. We're used to gathering in a particular physical location. Um, so I did want to highlight um, for me, as I said, coming to you from uh, the unceded territories of the Abiguit uh, Mi'kmaq First Nation, I would ask that you all consider uh, what it means uh, in the terms of your responsibility uh, as you work and, and live on First Peoples traditional territories. Second, I would also ask that you take the time to read the uh, excellent research data, data sovereignty contexts and documents that many of our colleagues in the First Nations, Métis and Inuit communities have developed. Um, there's also uh, an international Indigenous data sovereignty, a set of principles called CARE, which stands for Collective Benefit Authority to Control and Responsibility and Ethics. Um, and uh, I think you'll find increasingly as you um, gather in meetings or, or participate in data management initiatives uh, globally, you'll hear three terms, the FAIR principles, which I suspect many of us have heard, a more recent trust principles, and then the third one that is almost always these days mentioned in this kind of uh, three um, foundational principles in the data management are those CARE principles. So I certainly do encourage you uh, when you get a chance um, to, uh, to, to give those a look. Uh, we also are operating under a code of conduct, very similar to what we would uh, facilitate or work under in terms of a physical meeting. Uh, so uh, to maintain safety and inclusivity for all of our attendees, participants are invited uh, to uh, or encouraged to comply with our code of conduct. Um, questions and comments should be related to the subject of the event. Uh, personal or non-subject related questions not, are not appropriate. Uh, there will be no tolerance for any kind of harassment or inappropriate behavior. Uh, and the security of the event can be improved through collaboration between RDC and all of its registrants. So if you think somebody has um, entered into the, the summit uh, without the appropriate um, registration, then just let us know so that we can make sure that everybody's uh, experience is a good one. Uh, so I'd like to just um, cover a little bit of the history of the National Data Services Framework Summits. Um, this, uh, the National Data Services uh, context or phrase came about fairly early, at, uh, soon after I started, at least with uh, Research uh, Data Canada. Um, and a year after I started, or just, uh, just over a year after I started, we had the first um, National Data Services Framework Summit uh, in conjunction with the RDA plenary in Montreal. Was the first uh, Research Data Alliance plenary held in Canada, and it was a good opportunity to see a focus on international best practices and data management. Uh, so that event um, was the kickoff for the uh, summits. Uh, we skipped 2018 and the second one was held in Canada, Ontario, uh, where we focused on the development of a high level set of principles. And I'll come back to this con concept of um, research data management principles a couple of times throughout the summit. And then uh, last year in 2020, 2020, we again gathered in physically in Canada and uh, in that, a particular event, we revised and updated the Canada Declaration, uh, and we focused, we kind of drilled in a little bit more detail 
uh, into what it meant to be a national data service and trying to document what the existing Canadian national data services were and uh, what are the kind of the minimal expectations uh, to have, again, what we refer to as a national data service in the Canadian context. Um, so like any event like this, uh, the summits um, always have a group of folks that work behind the scenes. Uh, my colleagues at Canary, uh, especially in the communications team, as well as uh, Chantal and Melissa from Say Something Communications, of course, are doing a lot of heavy lifting and, um, and work with the actual event and getting it all set up. But in addition to that, we do have a National Data Services Framework Summit Working Group. Uh, so you can see uh, some of those uh, colleagues uh, in the uh, Zoom image, uh, of course, Melissa and Chantel, uh, Jeff Moon from Portage, uh, Philippe perez Justoff from Andrio, Elisa, Chin, David, uh, Karen, Felicity and Jane are all pictured in the, the Zoom and uh, not able to make that call were John, Shahira, Barton, Dion and Ella. So I would certainly like to thank them for, for the meeting with me over the last uh, eight months or so and uh, putting in the planning and, and uh, verifying some of the approaches that we were gonna use uh, in our event. So uh, many thanks to all of you. And as to our attendees, um, there's just over, I saw one or two uh, new registrations just in the last few minutes. So. I think we can safely say we're in the 235 attendee range. So a good increase, an increase of almost 100 uh, over the uh, last year's summit. Uh, so that's a good uh, increase in engagement. As you can see uh, from the slide, uh, just over half of those are from Ontario with a healthy uh, cohort from Quebec, uh, British Columbia, Alberta, Nova Scotia and uh, a number of colleagues from all of the other provinces, as well as one of the territories. And I should also say that that Vic at the end is a colleague from Australia, <laughs> Andrew Trelor, um, who works with a uh, colleagues in Australia on similar kinds of initiatives to uh, what RDC is doing with the NDSF, as well as what our emerging Andrea organization is doing. Uh, so thanks to, uh, to Andrew for getting up early uh, Australian time. Uh, this gives you a sense of the type of organization that we have represented. Uh, just under 60% coming from university and then a, a healthy uh, number of colleagues from both government and the nonprofit sectors. And then uh, following on that with uh, folks from colleges, polytechnics and institutes, as well as private sector uh, research hospitals and other. Uh, as to the kinds of roles, or you can maybe think of it as kind of the departmental context, um, you can see here uh, that there's 27% uh, of our colleagues from the libraries. And then we have a fairly even distribution of um, folks from the researcher community, uh, senior administrators and a, a general administration. And then we also have a strong showing from research service support uh, groups. So it's a good uh, cross section. And uh, as you can tell from the numbers, there'll be about 23 uh, people in the cohort groupings. And we did try to make uh, to see that we had a, a mix uh, in each of those cohorts to facilitate uh, different stakeholder views in those conversations. Uh, and I don't, it doesn't show here, it would be under the kind of research service provider or, or infrastructure provider, but we do also have a couple of colleagues from scholarly publishing here. One of the fields that you were able to fill out when you registered for the event is what was the, uh, what are we up to in RDM? Uh, so I just chose a few snippets uh, very, a fairly high number of colleagues that were involved in training kinds of initiatives. A colleague who highlighted that they're working with the Canadian Humanities and Social Sciences Commons, and that term commons, of course, we'll come back to. Uh, developing a data sharing platform for health data, collaborating on the development of the institutional RDM strategy uh, in response to the emerging uh, tri-council data management policy 
providing support to a shirk funded partnership grant uh, helping develop a strategy in a college context and working on a data hub for water quality with the data stream project so that's just a few of the snippets i didn't want to show um, all of them but it's uh, very interesting when we look at the profile of uh, the people that are here uh, that uh, who has uh, gathered in the event uh, for the summit. Um, one suggestion I would like to make um, is uh, just to make sure that we know who you are. Um, if you've never changed your Zoom name before, uh, this is how you can do that. Uh, you click on the participants uh, button and f under your name in the participants list, uh, you can click on the more uh, pull down button and choose rename. So for example, I've suggested that our moderators uh, in the sessions uh, change their name to be moderator dash Mark Leggett as an example or note taker, just to help you when you're in the breakout rooms, uh, get a better sense of, um, of who's who. Um, also, a couple of other things I wanted to highlight, um, because we're not using um, a webinar platform, we don't have the Q&A function. So I would encourage you to put any questions you might have in the chat. Uh, the the uh, two keynotes on day one and day two uh, will all feature um, a Q&A session at the end. Um, so that's an important uh, piece of the, uh, of the conversation. Um, so uh, please do uh, put your questions in, in chat and uh, between David Castle, who I'll introduce in a minute, and myself, we can uh, can queue up the questions for our uh, speakers. Um, I also wanted to recognize that uh, this is a four hour event. We have a break in the middle of a half an hour, uh, but I do recognize that folks will have to uh, get up and, and leave uh, at different times for different reasons. One of the challenges of working, as many of us probably are from home, uh, during these times is that interruptions are probably a little more frequent than they might be if you've ensconced in, in a, in a, a room at your, in your office setting. Um, so do feel free to, um, to come in and out. I would suggest that you leave your zoom room open to minimize the amount of time it takes for you to find that zoom link again, and you simply turn your video off, turn your audio off and, uh, go about what you need to do. And then when you come back, you can always uh, click on that breakouts room button at the bottom of uh, your Zoom screen and uh, re-enter that breakout room. The other thing, as I will talk about after our keynote, um, is that we have an, each of the cohorts has a shared document uh, in Google. And I realize there are probably a few of you that are not able to access Google documents, uh, but hopefully most of you can. Uh, and that's another way to interact uh, with colleagues uh, throughout the session is uh, through those uh, through those group note documents. So I think that's it for me in terms of uh, logistics. Um, so I would like to uh, introduce my colleague uh, David Castle. I suspect many who are on the call today uh, know David. Um, David is currently a professor in the School of Public Administration. Uh, and faculty member of the Peter B. Uh, Gustafson School of Business at the University of Victoria. Uh, David was uh, recent, most recently the Vice President of Research at the University of Victoria. And uh, we're also uh, lucky to have uh, David as the Chair of Research Data Canada Steering Committee. And increasingly, David is, um, is involved in a number of international data management activities. For example, he joined the uh, International Science Council's World Data System Scientific Committee in 2019. Um, and he has supported the creation of the new World Data Systems International Technology Office, which is hosted at Ocean Networks Canada at the University of Victoria. Uh, there's a number of other things that David's involved in, including he was a member of the OECD's Global Science Forum Expert Group that released a report on uh, building digital workforce capacity and skills uh, for data intensive science last year. Um, and David is also a member of the Science Advisory Committee of the Council of Canadian Academies. So with that, uh, David, uh, I will let you 
uh, introduce our keynote speaker. Great, thank you very much, Mark, and welcome everyone. Uh, so yes, I'm uh, very pleased to be the Research Data Canada uh, Chair of the, the Steering Committee. And I'm also a faculty member, as Mark indicated, at the University of Victoria. And uh, our uh, institution acknowledges with respect to the Lekwungen speaking peoples whose traditional territory uh, the university stands on and the Songhees, Esquimalt and Wasanich peoples uh, whose historical relationships continue uh, to this day. So uh, I wanted to also just underscore what Mark had to say about the importance of thinking about the work that we do with Indigenous peoples in Canada and uh, the evolving uh, landscape of, of norms and practices associated with uh, uh, managing research and managing uh, data uh, with uh, our Indigenous uh, uh, colleagues. So our session today um, and for the next two days is really actually thinking about how we can put into place something like an open research commons in Canada and how we should go about crafting such an open uh, research commons. And recently I was uh, reading a, an article in the UK Financial Times that was written by Yuval Noah Harari, who is the author of the book Sapiens. Many of you might have read that. Uh, and his article in the uh, Financial Times was uh, called Lessons from a Year of COVID. And he had some very interesting observations about uh, a number of factors that I think are actually quite relevant to the kind of work that we're trying to set out to do for the next three days, but also the manner in which we are doing it, which is remotely and digitally. And he, uh, Harari observed that uh, this really is an interesting moment in history when so many people took their uh, ordinary lives and moved it all online. So it became human life online. And that has a virtue of at least being able to avoid uh, physical viruses, uh, as we know. Um, and we also know that it comes with all sorts of upsides and, and downsides associated with that. But it is a remarkable thing that we actually have managed to move so much of certain types of work and activities and socializing into an online format. And it really, I think, uh, shows us the tremendous resilience of existing information and communication uh, technologies globally. Uh, it also shows where we need to do more work to improve access, uh, but it is a system that can be expanded and improved upon and it is working. And through that system, we also know that there's just a tremendous amount of movement of, of data. And indeed, access to data has been a cornerstone, not only of the scientific and biomedical response to the pandemic, uh, but access to data has also shaped our political sphere and our social interactions related to the pandemic or otherwise. Uh, but now we actually see access to data as being something which touches on pretty much all aspects of our, our lives, uh, which leads Harari to comment that we really need to think about ways in which we both, from a physical infrastructure point of view, in terms of our practices with respect to data management, uh, but also in terms of thinking about the uses of data in social and political contexts, that we really do need to think about what we can do to safeguard this absolutely critical digital infrastructure that we're all operating in. I encourage you to go and read the article. Fortunately, uh, it is an open access article, which is nice to see the Financial Times releasing more of their material uh, in that mode. But if you go and read this, I think you'll see that we are actually all part of what Harari is talking about. I think we can really uh, recognize ourselves uh, in this, uh, both in terms of what we're doing now, uh, with research data management, but also as we're thinking about the future and thinking about this open research commons, we're also really thinking about what we need to do next and what we should start now so that we actually have the kind of robust, resilient uh, uh, digital infrastructure serving not only research needs, but also all of the parallel activities and, and secondary act, uh, uses of, of research. 
So that's why we have these themes of this conference uh, this, this year. And it's really about uh, trying to uh, take stock of where we are now, but emulate a future that we would like to move into, thinking about the role that an open research commons could play in Canada and how our work in this country could actually support international efforts. So that's why we begin with the uh, very important theme of working together and thinking about what it's actually going to take to make a more coherent and seamless environment for us to undertake this, this work. And that, at least from the standpoint of thinking about our remit in Research Data Canada, that always goes back to thinking about what do researchers need. And so we spend a lot of time in this, uh, uh, this uh, summit this year, as with previous years, really uh, ground truthing everything that we we would like to do uh, back into the uh, lived experience of researchers and their uh, research groups to understand really what it is that's uh, driving them, uh, what resources they need uh, and where they see the future going. And we know at this point in time too, with the, uh, the emergence of the organization Endrio, uh, that we have a lot of work to do as well. Uh, mostly around system integration of the major uh, digital research infrastructure pillars, which are data management, research software, and advanced research uh, computing. And how that system integration goes is, is all important, certainly from an uh, interoperability point of view, but it also relates to the way that we will align platforms, services, and resources, and spell out some of the rules of engagement for how we actually want to see uh, our uh, research commons evolve. Uh, and naturally, we also think about the way we want it to evolve, not just for Canadian purposes, but so that we can also be uh, part of and aligned with the global open research commons. So this is the, uh, this is the subject for the, uh, for the next three days of, of this summit. Uh, and I think that there's no time uh, where it's more apparent that we really need to make sure that we have safeguarded our digital research infrastructure uh, and to make it really work for us in the way we want to see it work uh, for us uh, in order to be able to uh, bring about not only the research objectives that we care about, uh, but all of the benefits that come from uh, advanced research uh, and its contribution to, to society. So working together, and to a common purpose is where, where we start today. And I can't think of anybody better uh, to help this community uh, work together towards a common uh, purpose than our keynote speaker for this morning, which is Nizar Ladek. Uh, many of you will already know Nizar. Uh, and if you don't, you'll be very pleased to make his acquaintance digitally today. Uh, Nizar has, has a uh, a long and distinguished uh, track record in working with various groups uh, who rely on, on uh, research infrastructure and digital research in infrastructure in particular. Uh, he's been director of health services information, uh, worked with Kaihai in that respect. Uh, he's also served as vice president and chief information officer of the North York General uh, Hospital. And many of you will uh, know of him in uh, uh, more recent roles uh, in Ontario as uh, President and Chief Operating Officer of Health Quality Ontario. And then uh, in the last four years before he joined Andrio as the inaugural uh, President and CEO, he was uh, uh, Compute Ontario's President and CEO for, for four years. Uh, so uh, as I say, that's uh, Nizar's track record. Uh, but the other thing we can say of Nizar is that he is a tremendous community builder uh, recognized as such. Uh, and uh, we're very pleased, uh, I think, in this community uh, that uh, Nizar is, is leading Andrio uh, at a really critical time in which we can make some fundamental decisions uh, about how we want to work together uh, and what kind of common purposes we wish to drive toward. So I will uh, turn the floor over to uh, Nizar for his keynote uh, uh, address, and then we will have uh, some uh, discussion afterwards, uh, uh, which will be interactive and I'll be happy to moderate. So Mark, I think we can uh, load, uh, load uh, the first presentation. First presentation.
Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. It's my sincere pleasure to be speaking with all of you at our fourth annual National Data Services Framework Summit. I want to begin by sharing with you that much of my understanding of the research data management has been informed by a research paper that was produced by a number of my colleagues, and so I wanted to acknowledge them at the outset. These are Shahira Kerr, Rosita Dara, Susan Hay, Mark Leggett, Ian Milligan, Jeff Moon, Karen Payne, Elodie Portales Casamar, Guilain Roquet, Lee Wilson, who all came together to author the current state of research data management in Canada. The Kanada Declaration for me is an inspiring piece of work. It was put together by all of you in 2019 and 2020 summits. I was simply inspired. When I look at the words on this slide, the Kanada Declaration recognizes among many issues that researchers are the focal point for this conversation and their needs are central to the design and delivery of services and resources, both across and within specific domains. That creative researcher-centric engagement with agency and autonomy to share their data together with support for participation from all citizens enriches the open science community and creates an environment where all research can be questioned and advanced. For me, three things emerge from these words. The centrality of researchers in Canada, the need to enable agency and autonomy, and a recognition of an open science community to advance knowledge. For me, this speaks to an aphorism that has guided my life. A rising tide lifts all boats. It speaks to a number of nouns that we've been using as a theme for our approach towards research data management and the formation of Andrio. And it also speaks to the approach that I think is reflective of the work that our research data management colleagues have been doing across the country. These nouns are collaboration over competition, unity over division, and integration over segregation. Indeed, when these antonyms come to mind and you reread the Kanata Declaration, you can begin to understand the level of cooperation and commitment that we've observed in our ecosystem. What you see on this slide is a number of points that I've pulled from a report that uh, was produced by our community. It talks to limited access to archival storage. It speaks to other challenges like limited semantic and technical interoperability between DRI. It talks about a skill shortage that in data creation and preservation, we need to build throughout the country. It looks for harmonized governance to avoid further imbalances at the national level and sustainable, predictable funding models among a whole host of other activities. Indeed, each of these bullets speak to what hopefully will become the mandate that Andrio is able to embrace in our formation in serving Canada's researchers. From this slide, you see that Endrio's goal is to coordinate funding and strategic directions for national DRI activities in advanced research computing, research data management, research software, and cybersecurity. These are the pillars that will form Endrio's work, and our collaborative approach will guide the mechanism by which we achieve this mandate. Many of you would have seen this slide a number of times, hopefully. And so you'll be thankful to know I won't be walking you through this entire slide, but rather I want to give you an update on a number of these activities. For those of you who haven't seen it, I'll show you on the next slide where you can begin to access a YouTube video that we've produced that walks you through all of these particular elements along with my voiceover. For now, I want to share with you that as we began our work and we started to look at the needs of researchers across Canada, we focused on a number of white papers. I could not be more pleased with the response that we received. During COVID, while all of you were serving Canada's post-secondary future, you submitted in six weeks, 107 white papers. You responded with uh, documents that also informed our understanding. And all of these materials are now posted on our website for all of you to read. I'll acknowledge even I haven't read all of them, but I'm working my way through. We didn't ask for a hardcore data analytics exercise. Rather, we said to the community that as you think about your roles and as you think about our understanding 
what could you say to us that would put on our radar screen three to five pages that would really crystallize for us the issues and the challenges and the opportunities that you face as a community? And you did so. And so I encourage all of you to take the time to read this. But our 22 member researcher council is also hard at work. They're synthesizing all of it into a summary report that we'll be producing on our website shortly. We also are producing current state assessments for advanced research computing, research data management, and research software. And as I said at the outset, the current state assessment for research data management actually informed my understanding that I want to share with all of you. From there, we'll be embarking on a new service delivery model that will shape how we meet the needs of researchers and how we can service them. And then ultimately, all of that information will culminate into our strategic planning exercises. But what you see from this slide is a commitment to collaboration and consultation. At each juncture, we'll be coming out to the community and asking you, did we get it right? Are there nuances that we need to appreciate? So I share a little more detail uh, about this particular framework and our conceptual framework. Uh, and as I mentioned, it is recorded on our website. And so I'd like to share with you how to be able to access that. As you see from this particular slide, our website address is listed at the top left-hand corner. If you scroll across and click on the needs assessment tab, you'll be able to access all 107 white papers. You'll also be able to access the conceptual framework that we've produced with my voiceover. The needs assessment is also comprised of a survey. Right now, we have almost a thousand individuals have responded. And so I would encourage you to stay tuned as we begin to synthesize and analyze the results of this. And I hope many of you were able to identify it or, or were told that it existed so you could encourage your colleagues to be able to complete it. Now, as we're gathering all this work, you can see that we also have to build an organization. We're building an organization by working with our colleagues from Research Data Canada, from Portage, and from the advanced research computing regions that have made up the Compute Canada Federation. We're starting to think about how we need to configure ourselves in order to meet the needs of these various uh, stakeholders who have been served by these wonderful organizations. And I wanna share with you an update of where we're at today. In terms of our organizational structure, we have a, a typical structure comprised of four portfolios. We have a vice president corporate services, a vice president strategy and planning, a vice president operations and security, and a vice president communications and external relations. Now under them, I'd like you to look at these particular elements and think of them as more functional placeholders than you would uh, necessarily uh, specific roles we are beginning to populate this structure. I'm very pleased to share with you that we've signed an offer and our new Vice President Corporate Services, Narendra Dehal, will be joining us in a matter of days. Guilain Roquet, our Vice President Strategy and Planning has been well hard at work for a number of months and many of you have had the opportunity to meet Guilain and learn about our various approaches, whether it's the needs assessment or the current state assessments, which she's been at the helm for in delivering. We've extended written offers to our final vice presidents. We worked with Audres Bernstein, the recruiting firm, to do a truly national search. And when I'm in the position to be able to share the successful incumbents for these roles, you'll see that we drew expertise and talent from across the country. With regards to research data management, you'll see under the portfolio, under the vice president operations and security, that many of our colleagues from Portage, who I know you've all had the opportunity to interact with, will be moving over to Andrio, effective April 1. And I could not be more pleased. I'm sincerely happy as I've met the uh, various individuals and the caliber that they bring to strengthen our organization. So in building the organizational structure, I started to think about as a CEO, what is the four-year planning horizon that I ought to be adopting? Well, what you see here are the next four fiscal years. And then I've built in some animations that begin to share with you how we're starting to think about our role going forward. If we look actually way ahead to fiscal 23-24, I started to think about if I said was going to renew our organization in order to allow us to continue to do the work that we're doing and serve our researchers, one of the things that they need is they need the ability to ensure that researchers are deriving benefit and that their needs are being met by a restructured ecosystem. 
So in order to achieve that by the end of fiscal 23-24, we need to be able to think about the prerequisite year. In other words, what would need to be in place April 1st, 2023, in order for us to achieve what we had hoped to accomplish by April 1st, 2024? Well, we would need to develop a corporate plan with performance metrics to clearly measure whether we are benefiting researchers within the ecosystem that we have. Similarly, in order to be able to achieve our goals by April 1st, 2023, we need to, by April 1st, 2022, have achieved a fully integrated Compute Canada Federation, Portage, and Research Data Canada into our organizational structure to be able to deliver on a community-designed strategic plan and a national service delivery model. That's one short year away. In order to be able to accomplish that, we need to establish an organizational structure with plans and mechanisms to support Canada's researchers' needs, guided by an effective and accountable governance model. And so what I shared with you in the previous slide is our first step towards achieving that organizational structure. And if we were to achieve by April 1st, 2021, just a month away, that structure, what we've been focusing on over the past number of months is an organizational structure staff hires, HR transition plans, back office supports, work around a national service delivery model, a series of white papers, inaugural projects, and establishing the ecosystem culture of collaboration and partnership. And so what I hope for you see from that list is we've made progress. We've achieved much of the things that we had hoped to achieve. The one area which I wish to now engage you on is the last bullet that's listed there establishing an ecosystem of culture, collaboration, and partnership. In fact, when I began my role as CEO on October 5th, 2020, I started to think about what do we see in our ecosystem and what potentially needs to change. We saw today a system that's been characterized by division. Division from individuals and organizations holding different roles, those who manage computing environments, those who don't, those with computing environments, provincial, federal, and we weren't necessarily thinking like a system. And so from there, I started to think about what are the characteristics of our ecosystem that have made some of these challenges? Well, we see segregation. We see segregation of components. We have advanced research computing, research data management, research software, each that have evolved in some degree as different silos within our ecosystem. And why have these silos emerged? We see competition. Competition isn't bad. In fact, it's very healthy. But I think we had reached a stage where we were compromising some of the desired outcomes. We saw situations where during, for example, in ARC, we saw infrastructure competitions where BC would compete with Ontario or, on, or Quebec would compete with Atlantic Canada in order to be the successful recipients of infrastructure funding that was being made available. And then after the competition, we would say to them, okay, now share your best practices with each other. And people would wonder and they'd say, well, if I share my best practices or the particular niche that makes me who I am, how am I gonna win the next competition? And that's why I'd start to move away from these particular nouns. Nouns that I hope will characterize our ecosystem and our culture going forward. Nouns like unity, where we begin to work with each other and we aspire to serve as a team and gather together to understand how we can elevate Canada's researchers. Nouns like integration, where we begin to come together as an ecosystem, working in tandem as a team, as opposed to separate component parts. And lastly, collaboration. I have always believed in teamwork. It's something that's defined my leadership style and my work as I've moved forward. And I hope that this will be something that we can all embrace. And I'm happy to tell you, this isn't the first time I've made this, delivered this message and people are responding. We are coming together as a team in Canada. And so how would we begin to uh, create the ecosystem that I've described here? Well, of course, we'll do what comes naturally. We will do what is quintessentially Canadian in terms of our approach. Now, many of you might be wondering, what do you mean these are by a quintessentially Canadian approach? 
will allow me to share a little bit. <coughs> when one asks, what makes us Canadian? Typically, you'll receive responses that speak to our heritage, our history, our links to the United Kingdom or France, our Indigenous peoples. But the other thing that makes us quintessentially Canadian, well, the best way to illustrate that, if you'll indulge me, is to share a little bit of a video that will inject probably a little bit of levity and, and help you understand what it means to be quintessentially Canadian. This, my friends, this is what I consider to be quintessentially Canadian approach. In that context, let me share with you some of the detail about the nouns and the progress that we have made as a system. I spoke about collaboration over competition. You have three logos from three organizations, ACENET, our Advanced Research Computing Organization, Regional Organization in Atlantic Canada, Calco Quebec, the Advanced Research Computing Organization in the province of Quebec, and MILA, one of three national AI institutes in the pan-Canadian AI strategy. I'd begun my listening tour and I was working with many of these colleagues as we started to think about what are the needs of the AI research community going forward. It was through that collaborative table that we realized in Atlantic Canada, specifically at the University of Moncton, that there were a large growing number of researchers who specialized in AI research, but their needs weren't necessarily being met by the existing infrastructure. And so I spoke with my colleagues in Calco, Quebec and Mila, and I said, there are a number of researchers in Moncton who, by the way, are largely French speaking and would like to begin to access the research infrastructure that's in supporting AI. That's all I needed to say. Leaders at MILA and Calco Quebec and ACENET got together. And now, within the two months of the time that this issue arose, researchers are beginning to have their needs met by accessing infrastructure that's managed by Calco Quebec, infrastructure that's been arrived and supported at MILA, and now being um, extended to our colleagues in Atlantic Canada. Colleagues, this is collaboration over competition. And this is what we achieved in just two short months without additional cost. So now, as I start to think about our next set of nouns, I think about unity over division. Another thing that makes, us, makes me think about Canada is famed Canadian author, Robert Munch. Every parent has read, I love you forever. And every one of us have gotten a little bit of a tear in our eye each time we think about it. Well, Munch also wrote, we share everything. And I started to think about, do we share everything? Well, let me share with you some statistics that we were able to gather in this, in this regard. The World Giving Index uh, by the Charities Aid Foundation is the largest survey of charitable endeavors. It's a survey that uh, encapsulates 1.3 million people in 125 countries globally. We look at sharing behaviors like, did you help a stranger? Did you donate money to a charity? Have you volunteered time to an organization? Colleagues, Canada ranks sixth of 125 countries. This belief system can cascades to air Canadian attitudes towards data sharing. So as I address an audience of research data management professionals, 
one of the things that I started to think about is what are our attitudes towards data sharing and data management? There was a 2018 study by the Canadian Marketing Association, which found 76% of Canadians are pragmatic or unconcerned about sharing their personal data. The other statistic that uh, caught my attention is the fact that millennials, with regards to sharing or being unconcerned about using their personal data, this number increased to 86%. Now, why is that important? By next year, Statistics Canada has shared with us that millennials will represent 40% of our workforce. So colleagues, the horizons ahead is very bright. There's a strong commitment and an attitude towards using data to improve uh, situations, to improve the way we understand specific complex issues. But we need our colleagues from research data management to create the appropriate protections, the privacy issues, and the frameworks to enable this data sharing. But as we strive to achieving unity over division, you can know that the future ahead is very bright. People are wanting to share their data and realize that the collective use of that data will benefit our broader society. And so that brings me to my last noun and I start to conclude the presentation. What you see here is America's general viewpoint and Canada's viewpoint about how we think of ourselves as Americans and Canadians. In 1908, Israel Zangwill penned a play that was named The Melting Pot. While many people have probably forgotten the purpose of that or the storyline in that particular play, the idea of a melting pot, which brings together all immigrants to transform them into Americans, has had a lasting legacy. Now, in direct contrast, sociologist John Porter in 1965 talked about a vertical mosaic. Porter talked about the concept of Canada as a mosaic of different ethnic, language, regional, and religious groups. He used this framework to begin to challenge our concepts of unequal status and inequities. But he also used it as a framework that many of us afterwards in academia have used to understand and hopefully embrace the various elements that stem from our immigrant stories. In that context, I apply that framework to ARC, research data management, and research software. My hope is we acknowledge the differing power structures and influences of each, but begin to also realize the process of weaving a tapestry of the strengths and opportunities of each of us so that in an amalgam, we can enrich our DRI landscape. Colleagues, as I conclude, three messages you should take from today's talk. We have an evolving plan. It's not complete and it will benefit from iterations and additional input, but we are beginning our work and we're starting to see some progress. You can expect to be engaged in that process, whether it's in the design of the national service delivery model or in the remarkable ways you've already responded by submitting white papers. You will be at the core of forming our mandate going forward. And lastly, by addressing those various nouns that I've spoken about in our presentation this morning, collaboration over competition and unity over division, I believe that collectively, we can aspire to making Canada a global leader in the knowledge economy. Thank you, merci, and miigwech. Hi, Nizar. Hi, David. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, and uh, now, I don't know if you have been monitoring the chat yourself. Um, uh, it, well, you nodded yes. So was there something in there that you wanted to respond to immediately? Or would you like me to pick one for you? <laughs> if you would pick one, because I'm reading and uh, and uh, I, I think I'm happy to respond to all of them. But I'll, I'll, uh, I'll defer to you as our facilitator. How, how okay. best you proceed. Well, then I'll start uh, actually with one of the first questions, which came from uh, Eugene, uh, who, who asked, how can we make sure that Canadian researchers are aware of NGOs, work and engage in the process with different disciplines, having uh, different data and computing cultures? And so I you know, could go from the generalists to the specialists and, and uh, all of the different kinds of uh, uh, cultures of, of research that we know exists out there. So 
how do you how do you get your arms around such an important issue as, as that? Yeah, thank you, thank you, Eugene, for the question. Um, you know, as I as I sort of read through the questions uh, that are coming up in the chat, I, I, I'll, I'll preface by saying, of course, there's no magic solution. Um, uh, to, to many of the questions that have been raised and that we are hoping to sort of go through an iterative process, a bit of a trial and error, some things we won't get right, and I want to say that right at the outset, uh, and some things we might be fortunate enough to, to start to satisfy. But I guess the message I wanted to leave with all of you is that um, it, it's going to take all of us to help do this. So Eugene, the specific answer to your question that came to mind is, is I think three things. Um, as we think about how we can begin to engage as, as large a community as Canadian researchers, of which I've been told there's over 8,000 uh, based on my conversations with University uh, Universities Canada and the U15 and, and many others, I, I think there are three, three vehicles that we've been actively exploring. Whether there are more, I'm, I'm very open to any suggestions. The first has been um, in regards to our three pillars, we've been working with the ARC regions and with Research Data Canada and, and Portage in trying to convey, you know, share with us your insights about what are your needs? How are you accessing these particular elements? As we've been um, uh, conducting sessions like this is trying to get the word out, really just raise awareness. Um, there's over 170 or almost 170 people on this one. And so we're hoping each of you will serve as ambassadors to say, this is what Andrio is hoping to accomplish as we start to build our ecosystem and our community. And here are various opportunities there's the really easy things to do, like going to our website and signing up for any contact information um, or signing up your contact information so you can get announcements like the needs assessments and other, other vehicles. Um, and, and what I would also really benefit from, because I think later or immediately after, Scott talked about how, how he at University of Alberta has been sharing, uh, has been uh, approaching this. Um, it's best practices like that, where all of you say, hey, this has worked for us. Do you want to try it? Uh, how can we help you? And so I think... Um, uh, it's a combination. It's not going to be one thing that's going to get us as you as you will. And and I don't mean to sound uh, pedantic at all. Like we all know it's not going to be one thing. It's going to be a number of different avenues that we have to pursue to really engage the uh, the researchers in a variety of different mechanisms. I'd like to try to weave a couple of questions here to, together just in the interest of time also because we see quite a few of them coming in. So um, uh, uh, I was speaking with a colleague this morning uh, about about open science issues, and uh, he observed that you know data doesn't really want to be free. Data will stay where it wants to be, and and it's ex it's expensive to make it accessible and to to move it around. There's a cost for all of all of that. So there's a there's a question about really um, you know uh, motivations uh, of researchers to to share. Um, but there's, uh, I think Dom was also raising a question too about, um, you know, in addition to the uh, incentives and, and what natural motivations people might have to share. Um, are, in your view, do we have some distance to go towards shifting not only the, that, that kind of culture you were just speaking about, but also providing um, some skills to make us better sharers and more uh, equipped and, and enabled? And we certainly have done a lot of that at RDC. Um, and the summit, of course, is one element of it. But Andrea, now with uh, your your position on the landscape, uh, how do you see that going going forward? So motivations, incentives, skills. Yeah, absolutely. I think if we were having this conversation at say the uh, third uh, uh, summit, uh, I would have said we have a long way to go. COVID did a number of things. And the reason why at our fourth summit, I'm extremely encouraged about the willingness to share is, you know, I, I, it's kind of a weird way to phrase it, but despite all of the tragedy and all of the misery that came from COVID, there were a couple of positive spotlights, right? And maybe I'm looking at the glass has half, half uh, full versus half empty. But I think all of us were remarkably taken aback by the fact that typically vaccine production or vaccine distribution will take years based on clinical trials and other things. And we're sitting here at the one year anniversary of COVID and we have three vaccines being distributed to millions of people around the world. And the way that was actually achieved, I've, I've actually produced a blog if folks wanna have a look at it that talked about the summit supercomputer in the United States, 
which took the possibility of uh, uh, close to about 70,000 different chromosomal connections that could lead us towards a path of a, of a vaccine. And that information, because it was produced on a publicly funded computer, was made available to all pharmaceutical companies and all researchers royalty free. They shared their data. And uh, as a result of running those possible combinations again on the summit in uh, Summit Supercomputer, it narrowed it down to 70 possible connections. And that's why we find ourselves 12 months later, not from not only just benefiting from one vaccine, but three and a fourth one now also in production or, or achieving uh, FDA and Health Canada approvals for distribution uh, and, and going into the arms of, of Canadians and, and others um, is because I think what the world is starting to recognize for the really wicked problems, climate change, um, cancer, dementia, heart disease, uh, the uh, COVID, pandemics, like we all know this is not the last pandemic. This is simply a signal to us of many more machinations of genetics and other things of that nature. That I think as a, as a global community, if we come together, we can address these particular issues. And the pharmaceutical companies aren't losing money over this. They're still making tons and tons of money and managing their profit shares and, and all of these other aspects. But it was, um, you know, it was focusing on first to market versus first to, uh, first to solution. And so I think, um, I think what COVID has perhaps taught us is that there are other ways to continue to benefit from collaborating. Um, and, and I think that will start to spill over uh, more globally, at least it's my hope. Even if it doesn't, I guess what I'm here to say is Endrio will lead the, uh, lead the charge with all of you beside us to say, as Canadians, we're a 38 million population, and yet we've been punching above our weight globally for years. And how can we continue to do that with five supercomputers and the small groups like P uh, Research Data Canada and Portage? Because we come together. And so collectively, we have the innovation and the strength and the power to be able to be a leader in the global stage, um, but not as individual provinces and not as individual researchers in some respects. I think coming together, we'll be able to push the envelope much further. Well, it's uh, some of the silos you spoke about, Nazar, in your, in your talk are, um, uh, you know, they're sort of system bugs that have arisen because of our interesting confederation. And I think what you're proposing is that we should try to turn those uh, um, bugs into features of the system where we, where we have you know, the distributed devolved authority to do things, but we come, we come together. And there was one question that came up a little bit earlier, which was uh, a question that was about what, how do we actually work with uh, people who are not in the in the sort of franchise of of uh, being researchers, uh, you know, titled researchers in institutions, but groups such as um, citizen scientists, for example. Uh, and how do we how do we work with such uh, such groups as as that to actually have them part of the you know the data sharing enterprise and building a, an open research commons in this in this country? Do you? From your experience, perhaps uh, uh, working uh, in the in the health context, um, where you would have encountered, for example, patient advocacy groups who have very uh, 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 very deep insights about uh, about uh, uh, about individual cases, but also just uh, management of, of disease burden and so forth. Um, do you have some ideas about how to get the the tent a little bit broader? Uh, to include such such groups, yeah, absolutely. Um, and and I and I love that you were insightful enough to pick up on on my healthcare background because I think that's where there are some lessons to be learned, and the parallels are are enormous. So I'll, I'll pick it up from two different viewpoints. We have a Canada Health Act that dis, that ensures you know Canadians, regardless of their location, income, or other features, are able to access a minimum level of care. And and that's federally what is the requirement as transfers pay, payments go out. I've long thought about whether there's going to be a, a Digital Research Infrastructure Act of some kind, which talks about federal transfer payments from Endrio to make possible a minimal level of experience um, uh, and, and access to things that then provinces pick up through the cost sharing formula to say, this is how we'll then uh, uniquely and culturally sensitively embrace those aspects in our communities. 
Uh, and so based on priorities of, of provinces and areas where we know, you know, even simple research endeavors like forestry in BC or fisheries in, in Atlantic Canada or mining and manufacturing in Ontario or elsewhere, or our, our beautiful Canadian natural resources in the maritime or in the prairie provinces. I think that's where they begin to then um, massage those particular opportunities to sort of embrace. Um, the, the second component, I think, is uh, for the last 10 years, healthcare has been shifting more towards patient-centered care, family-centered care. And in many ways, I think the parallel that we draw from that is research-centered care or research-centered support. And so as research identify, researchers across the country identify that we need common frameworks, whether it's through the expectations that are being communicated by the tri-councils around having research data management frameworks in place in order to access granting council money, or uh, through um, uh, you, you know, uh, collaborating with the tri-councils and ensuring that when you're approved for your research grant, you have the cycles available that you asked for. Um, I think that's where what we can do federally, but at, at a provincial levels, it's trying to empathize and understand that what researchers require are not uniform and not homogenous. And so how do we engage the, research, the regional councils? How do I work with our colleagues in uh, in Portage and in Research Data Canada to say, how, you know, what are the structures that allow researchers to define the mechanisms by which they access as opposed to being uh, paternalistic and telling them how to be able to do that. Lastly, I think that's what excites me most when I reference the Canada Declaration at the, at the beginning part of my presentation, is it speaks to a research-centric care, a research-centric environment where they begin to share with us how they wish to uh, achieve these, uh, these mechanisms. Uh, so we can truly be unique uh, and, and specific in supporting some of their needs. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I don't want to leave people to think, oh, this guy's pretty naive and <laughs> rose-colored glasses. Um, I, I clearly understand I'm being aspirational, but I think uh, there are mechanisms that allow us to sort of perhaps uh, focus the way in which we're delivering these these uh, these services uh, in ways that make uh, best uh, you know uh, advantage of what researchers need. Even the way we've been doing it in ARC for years, all of my colleagues will say, you know, the, the RAC competition's got to change in some ways. The way in which we access it, uh, where you know a, a, a smaller and smaller percentage who need this volume of activity are getting access, and those of us in the long tail distribution aren't getting. Uh, that access. So, so instead of seeing it as a challenge and, and, and saying, well, that's just how it is, I, I guess what I'm, I'm trying to convey is Andrea is open to these ideas uh, and, and we want to hear from researchers about how we can be best fulfill our mandate to serve your needs. Well, I think, you, you know, no one would ever suggest that you're naive. I think what mm. you're <laughs> doing is trying to set the tone and uh, uh, we'll get to some interesting questions in a minute about about the positioning of Andrio. There was an earlier question actually, which was a, a little bit more straightforward, which was a, a question of, of how we're actually going to be able to keep track of, of Canadian researchers' international uh, uh, connections. Um, certainly we can pick up that sort of thing through bibliometric analysis, but, um, but I think more to the point, you know, what, what sort of um, implications do you see that having for Andrew's outlook in terms of serving a, a community of, of researchers who are uh, doing what all researchers do, which is take domestic money and play internationally in the global research community. So, so mm -hmm. how, how, have you given much thought to, to Andrew's outward looking face and how that's going to work? Yeah, very much so. It, it's, um, uh, I, I believe, and, and I'll share with you, even in my interviews with my board, uh, when I was applying for this role, uh, my board is of strong view that we need to play in the global space more effectively than we have. Um, uh, and, and what I mean by that is that I think one of the advantages, and, and speaking back to the formation of Endrio through the Leadership Council for Digital Research Infrastructure, is having sort of a, a single body that uh, international organizations can begin to collaborate with, whether it's the remarkable stuff that, David, I know you've been at the helm at, at and Mark Leggett, uh, uh, in terms of our international presence or, or other avenues. Um, People like, like a lot of you'll see my, my themes start to come together. People like to work with Canadians. Uh, when I've gone out internationally and spoken about what uh, what our you know our organization is planning to do, or even in past roles, 
Um, one of the things that was remarkable to me is that our very niche, the thing, the fabric that makes us Canadians is our biggest attraction. And, and I've seen quantifiable evidence of how that uh, translates to economic benefit. So, so I'll share this anecdote where when I've been out in international forums and I've said, uh, why is it that you like to uh, you know, uh, uh, access Canadian software, Canadian research data management frameworks, or, or the way we do things. And they say, it's because of your multilingual policy and your multi multicultural policy. And I said, well, that's fascinating. Explain that to me. And they say that when you look at software or you look at uh, the way in which codes or uh, frameworks are put together, it's very much an outcome of lived experience. Today's International Women's Day. Go home tonight, and for those of you uh, who have a partner or a friend, uh, you know, a sibling or someone, ask them to do something on their phone. And I can wager for you that the person who is male and female will likely do it differently. And that's because the lived experiences of a female are quite different to, than that of a male. And she or, you know, would have interpreted a particular tact, even though the outcome's the same, somewhat differently. I've done this experiment myself a number of times, and it's usually proves correct. But the other aspects that affect our lived experiences are ethnic identities. And the likelihood that software or frameworks such as, uh, you know, RDM frameworks are produced by a multilingual audience or a programming team uh, with different cultural and ethnic uh, experiences makes adoption of our Canadian exports that much faster. So if we're working with Spain, the likelihood that someone with a, a, a you know, a Spaniard was on our, our, our project team is very high. If we're working in Colombia, there's a Colombian on our project team or France or England. And it's the nature of the way they approach a particular exercise or a particular approach that makes it much more adoptable. And so I think on, our, on the international scene, one of the things I really hope to do is to convey our Canadianness and how that translates to economic benefit and advancements in, in research. Um, and so, so, you know, without specifics, uh, which I'm hoping to get over the course of the remainder of this year, as we get into strategic planning and national service delivery models, um, I think there's something there that we could really exploit to our, to our global and our national benefit. I have just one one last question uh, for you. I'm going to try to weave together a couple of, of comment sort of comment type questions that were in in the chat. Uh, and and I know that Mark would like to move us along to the next session, but um, I like to uh, to you know revert back to historical traditions of always driving the first session over time. <laughs> at this at this summit, so I don't want to disappoint Mark in that respect either. But so the question the question here is is um, it's a pretty pretty sort of big big conceptual question. But there were a couple of interesting remarks in the in the comments to the fact that we actually uh, what you're what you're proposing and and the way that you laid it out in your talk is 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 a kind of a value based approach to essentially renorming our DRI system here. And I suppose in some respects that norm would, there'd be some change in norms around, around research and communities of, of practice. But I think you're also um, proposing some structural changes that'll maybe influence people's choice architecture as, as, as well. So I, 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 I wonder, uh, uh, how how you see this playing out in terms of sort of remasterminding the system and whether or not along the way you you believe that Entrio actually has has a, has a role to play in actually shaping and preparing a different kind of research community and research culture in the in the country and whether or not that's an active part of your your mission yeah i i think it absolutely is but it's i would say it's less us instigating or initiating as much as us perhaps jumping on the bandwagon that I think already is existing in research. And, and let me say a little bit about that. You're, you're absolutely right in terms of my hopes is to renorm and, and almost reset the community to a big degree. But those aren't my hopes. That's what the Leadership Council for Digital Research Infrastructure and I said said we needed to do. That, you know, whatever we were doing, the, you know, the, the old definition of Einstein's definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different outcome. We, we had given out our college try for the last 10 years and it still wasn't meeting the needs of our researchers who are the people we serve. 
And so we reset and we, and we brought together different organizations so they wouldn't continue to operate in silos, but would start to benefit one another. And, and, and that's the structure that I've, that I've shared with you. Um, but in terms of re renorming, um, unfortunately, I think we broke trust as well with researchers. I think by virtue of the actions of our predecessor organizations, uh, researchers lost trust and lost faith in, in how we were going to meet their needs. And so the reset is both structural as well as cultural, where we need to regain, re-earn that trust amongst researchers that their needs are going to be met. But when I said, and, and this is my last comment, because I don't want Mark to get mad at me, but the, 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 when I talk about us building on what's already happening in research, interdependent or interdisciplinary research is not a new thing. And so we've seen breakthroughs come through when um, biologists and uh, industrial engineers approach a particular problem or when we see humanities and uh, astrophysicists approach a particular problem. And I guess what I'm trying to do through this cultural reset in, in many ways is take advantage of those. If you look at the number of papers in nature and you look at the papers in JAMA or in, in you know, other, other sort of big things, you'll see that researchers are frequently more working with people outside their disciplines to bring the various frameworks that allow us to attack problems we've not been able to solve. Uh, you as the former you know, VPR, you're well aware that graduate training is all about uh, taking the frameworks we understood in undergraduate studies and then applying critical thinking and, and understanding how we can use our subject matter frameworks in different environments and challenging what we've learned, but using those as to challenge others. And researchers have long picked up on that, is that if I have a industrial uh, you know, engineering solution uh, or, or issue, maybe I need to bring in a physicist or a biologist to think differently. And I think that's what we're trying to do through these frameworks is that we've got a number of challenges about how researchers conducted, what tools are available to them. And so in, in many ways, I think um, the approach that we take, rather than reinventing or just tweaking what we have done, we're looking for whole scale different approaches, right? Why do the same thing and expect a different outcome as, as I shared? So, so in many ways, I do think this is going to become uh, quite influential and, and, and quite um, sort of uh, exponential in its impact is if we start to bring a variety of different disciplines together to say, this is our problem. How would you solve it based on your training and your frameworks? And, and, and that's my hope. Well, Nizar, thank you so much uh, for those, those uh, your, uh, your formal remarks, but also the, the Q&A session here. Um, I think that you've, uh, both in substance and tone, have really uh, kicked off this uh, session on working together, but the conference as a whole about thinking about an, an open research commons in Canada uh, very effectively. So I, I want to thank you very much, and uh, I hope you're able to stay with us for much of the rest of the, the summit, at least keep an ear to the ear to the screen, as it were, yes. uh, as as we as we continue along. So thanks very much again. Thank you, David, and thank you everyone for the invitation. Uh, and uh, uh, my sincere hope is that as as the vaccine uh, starts to proliferate, that we'll have the opportunity to meet face to face, and and you can share your ideas with me. I, I would love nothing more than that. So thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, David and Nizar. Um, I've certainly come to appreciate uh, Nizar's style, but uh, in particular, uh, the open and transparent way that Andrea was, uh, is functioning as it emerges uh, in this important ecosystem. So many thanks for those uh, remarks and responses to questions. So I am going to now do my best to <laughs> explain how the breakouts are going to work. I had originally uh, planned to introduce each of the five breakouts, but rather than kind of disrupt the flow of conversation, and I'm hoping that um, given the questions in the chat for Nizar that, uh, that folks continue uh, this uh, conversation into your breakout groups. Uh, it's the, the critical part of this year's summit, so I will uh, do my best to kind of give you a sense of how the breakouts will work in general and not interrupt by bringing you out of the breakouts into the full plenary uh, four times over the next two days, but rather explain it now and then I will pop in and out of the breakouts uh, over the next uh, two days to see if uh, folks need a hand. 
So uh, first of all, so there are a total of five breakouts. The first four breakouts all have the same approach and desired outcome, which is essentially notes of your conversation within your breakouts, uh, as well as the kind of kernels of wisdom, if you will, uh, that you feel will be important actions that will help uh, change the, uh, the culture and the things that uh, Nizar and David were talking about. So, and as uh, Melissa mentioned at the start, each of the breakouts, including the fifth breakout, are all uh, the same cohort of people will, uh, will gather together in their conversation over the next three, after, three days. So that uh, we decided to do it that way to keep the conversation going, give people some familiarity, kind of duplicate as best we could the, the round table conversation that would happen at a typical summit or any kind of physical event that you would typically go to. And then in order to kind of get a sense of what you, the community at the end of the day, feel are the important kernels of wisdom that come out of the conversation, we're gonna use an upvote tool which I will talk about uh, in more detail when the time comes. So this may seem a little bit complicated and uh, unfamiliar to those of you who didn't drop into the, the Google Docs. So each cohort uh, from A to J, so there are 10 cohorts and each cohort has a single Google document. There's also a French uh, document that has been fully translated. And I would encourage, and the moderators and note takers know to try to focus the conversation in the English version of the Google document so that everybody can see it at the same time. But for my French speaking colleagues, please feel free to add uh, comments either in that English document, or if you feel more comfortable in the French versions of the document, and we'll make sure we look at those when we produce our final report. So each of the first four breakouts, so today and tomorrow, all have the same structure that you see on the screen now. And I'm just gonna kind of explain how this is intended to drive the conversation. So all of the 10 cohorts in each of the four breakouts all share that same outcome at the top of the screen. So what is outcome number one? The research data management needs of researchers, et cetera, et cetera. That outcome statement is shared across all 10 breakouts but is different for each of the four breakouts. So a, a different uh, statement of the outcome that we desire. So in this particular outcome, what we want you to think about and create statements for are the needs of researchers and how those intersect with existing or emerging RDM services and resources in the next one to three years. The Next part, that group 1A, and that would be group 1A, group 1B, group 1C, that is called the theme. So in this case, it's governance. So the theme of the conversation, we're hoping to kind of shape your, your thought processes and your actionable statements around the concept of governance. And in the context of going down to that stakeholder role, in this case, publishers and communities of practice. So we decided to pull uh, both the publisher community, i.e. scholarly uh, journal ecosystem and communities of practice, whether you think of that as your academic uh, domain society or your particular community that meets around the conference event each year. So in this particular case, we want you to think of a researcher, but through the eyes of publishers and those communities of practice, and in the, in the theme of governance. And with that kind of lens, or that lens of governance with respect to publishers and those domain uh, communities, you would consider the question, so how can publishers and communities of practice be effective, effectively represented at the governance table? So this is one of those questions that's designed to say, how do we make sure that that voice uh, is heard uh, in that all important element of governance. So there are two questions in each breakout and both of the questions often they'll kind of say, what are the three most important or what are the most important? Feel free to list as many kind of statements as you wish. Our goal is to have actionable statements. So for example, an actionable statement here might be uh, publishers and communities of practice uh, you know, should um, 
be represented at an appropriate uh, body within the Andrio context or some other national organization in order to ensure that their interests are represented at that high level governance context. And that that should be a, a you know assigned a task assigned to an organization like an NGO, and ideally that that governance um, uh, particip participatory governance approach should happen in the next six months or next year, whatever seems appropriate. So those actionable statements in response to the questions, in through the lens of the particular stakeholder and the theme that is suggested in that second row from the top. So I left the context for the end because that's simply that. It's a, a, a one or two statements derived from the Canada Declaration. And it's simply there as context to try to maybe introduce you to one way of thinking about the concept of governance or, uh, so it's simply a context there for people that might find it helpful uh, to get themselves into that conversation. So hopefully with your moderators uh, help and you have each cohort has a moderator and a note taker. The moderator is there to steer the discussion uh, in view of the fact there's going to be between 15 and 20 some people in each breakout room. Uh, you will develop your own comfort approach to how you facilitate the conversation. But one of the, the good ways, of course, is to raise a virtual hand in the Zoom room to let people know that you'd like to speak. So that discussion will be recorded in notes. Though the, the kernels of kind of core action statements will be recorded, uh, hopefully with a stakeholder and a timeline identified. Uh, and those will be moved into the updating, upvoting tool so that everybody can vote on which they think are the most important things that need to happen uh, to transform the approach that we take. So there's no real kind of magic, as you all know, you've all participated in these kinds of things. I would particularly highlight the need to be creative and bold. Don't be shy to say that uh, our national funding agencies must require, and if you're passionate about ORCID IDs, must require researchers to have an ORCID in order to submit a funding proposal by such and such a date. Uh, make sure they're actionable and be agile. Feel free to go and change things around. And uh, the note takers and moderators both have access to the upvoting tool. Uh, so they will be able to, uh, to uh, change the terminology as you move through your day. Also the reason why we wanted people uh, to be together in cohorts. So that's the approach to the conversation. In order to um, facilitate the introduction to tomorrow, so day two, we decided that instead of having a, a third keynote, i.e. keynote on day two and then another on day three, we decided to go with what's called the Pechakat Pechakacha or Pechakucha approach. So for those that have done it before, it's basically a, in our case, I modified the timing a little bit. So each cohort group will have 15 slides and the deck is, link is provided in your documents. And those slides are gonna auto advance every 20 seconds. Uh, so what you need to do as a cohort, and I would suggest you try to at least get a few people that are comfortable uh, doing this, get a few people who will kind of chat with each other or gather at an appropriate time to add Im an image or a word to each of the 15 slides in the associated deck. And then one of the people from your team could also be two, but I would suggest you don't wanna to do too many people because it will start to get a little confusing as we transition between people. So each of the 10 cohorts will present on the theme that is identified in the Pechkucha slide deck, and they will have five minutes to do that. And at the end of it, we'll, we'll use that same upvote tool. So tomorrow we will use the upvote tool. So it'll be a bit of a test uh, for you to be comfortable with that. And we'll be able to upvote uh, your favorite Pechkucha session tomorrow morning. Um, and I would suggest that once you identify, don't worry about the speaker, just identify people that are happy to kind of add 
slides, uh, images, and or a single word to each of those slides over the next, uh, uh, over the course of the next two breakouts. And that will feed into the session for tomorrow morning. So that's the instruction for the breakouts. The moderators and note takers have kind of had a more detailed uh, summary and overview of how this will work. I suspect that the first breakout will be a little bit confusing as everybody gets their position and understands who the moderator is and those kinds of things. Um, so be comfortable with uh, taking a little bit of extra time. So between now and the closing plenary of this afternoon, those breakout rooms will remain open. So you can stay in the breakout rooms. You can have kind of side conversations with each other through the chat. Uh, you can pull together your Pecha Kucha group and they can maybe decide that they want to gather over 15 minutes during the half hour break between the two breakouts. You can also leave, as I mentioned at the top, at any point in time, I suggest you leave your Zoom room open, uh, go do what you need to do and just come back and pop back into your particular cohort room. So now I'm gonna press the trigger and uh, Chantal and Melissa are gonna automatically move everybody into your appropriate cohort. And then uh, I will work with them to make sure we have the final group of folks that uh, are having issues moving into the breakout rooms do so. And then I'll pop into the rooms to see if any of you need any assistance. So we can go ahead to uh, Chantel and Melissa and we'll move folks into their rooms. So I think we're probably pretty good. We've got... Uh, Chantel suggested we have a fair number of folks back. I think we're probably seeing a little bit of the uh, later in the day as well as um, people uh, uh, not, re not returning to the main plenary but uh, heading off to other business items. So that's fine. Um, so I've got a couple of um, things I want to cover here. The first one is uh, a bit on the logistics side. And then I'm going to do a variation of my own Pechikucha or Pikachu. <laughs> By the way, Pechikucha is Japanese for chit chat. Um, so I won't attempt to do the uh, proper Japanese pronunciation. Um, so I'll do a variation on that as a way to um, give people a sense of how it's intended to work. Uh, tomorrow morning. Um, so first of all, um, I thought I would just make a few personal comments about the environment in which we've gathered today, because I know that's uh, one that uh, folks are embracing or struggling with or otherwise <laughs> uh, positive or negative about. Um, in a former life, actually in two institutions, I was an associate dean uh, for education or uh, something similar and had responsibility for online learning and continuing education and working with my academic colleagues on uh, different aspects. And the one thing that I think we can all appreciate in an attempt to facilitate discussion in an online context is that online collaboration is hard. <laughs> We're just um, we're just so used to that face-to-face uh, -face gathering. We're used to being fed. Uh, we're used to having a nice room, a nice facility in which to gather, and the opportunity to see friends and colleagues and have a side conversation and all of those kinds of things. Um, and part of these comments, as I went in and out of the the breakouts. Um, get a sense of some of the uh, the challenges folks were having and in some of the sessions and in some of them there's five or six pages of notes uh, which is good to see. Uh, of course the other issue with meeting in a Zoom context when you're doing breakouts and discussions is that getting distracted in cyberspace is easy. <laughs> so it's uh, pulling yourself out of a conversation is easy. Um, putting yourself back in can be a challenge. Um, 
so I appreciate that this is um, a new way of doing the summit. And uh, I also appreciate that moderators and note takers um, had a few, we had one call last week, and then I had a couple of emails that went out to try to kind of give folks a sense of, of what the expectations were and, and what the uh, flow in the, the breakout rooms might look like. Um, and that will vary uh, from person to person and breakout room to breakout room. So before I go into kind of providing a little bit of commentary on on the first two breakouts. Any comments, suggestions on the process? Because we're going to have two more breakouts tomorrow. So I thought I would uh, pause here since people are fresh back from the breakout rooms to get a sense of the uh, temperature in the room, uh, things that people thought uh, were good, and uh, things that you might uh, have in terms of suggestions for. For tomorrow. So feel free to raise your hand if you want. Um, I will open up the chat as well so that I can see what folks are doing. <laughs> I like Mike's uh, Mike's comment. You weren't hoping we'd stay on topic, were you? <laughs> That's the other it's also easy, not only is it easy to get distracted by putting yourself into another space in cyberspace, but it's very easy to get distracted. So for me, the critical part is not to, um, is not to have you know, such an intense focus on answering the questions um, that it, uh, in a sense, gets, a, gets in the way of a good conversation. And that, I think, will happen whether we're gathered face to face or whether we're in a virtual Zoom room uh, like we are uh, this week. So I certainly appreciate that getting off topic is going to happen. I would encourage folks to get off topic. At the end of the day, I think the, um, the key interests that we have, and I think everybody here has, is what are those critical actions that uh, we can hope to encourage various stakeholders in the community to consider carefully in order to move things forward. So I wouldn't worry too much about getting off topic if you're able to turn it into a conversation about um, best practices and uh, what are the specific actions that will help uh, our colleagues move the conversation forward. Um, again, highlighting uh, as Michael Steelworthy did. Uh, thanks for the moderators and note takers. Uh, it's a tough job, and I suspect people will get a little, a little more um, comfortable with it tomorrow. Uh, it's. I like Andrew's comment that it's seven twenty a.m. in Australia. <laughs> so Andrew, Andrew has been at it for a while. Um, we also have another international colleague on the call. Not quite as late for uh, Natalie, but. Uh, Natalie Harrower has also joined the group. I'm not sure if Natalie's here. Natalie's in Ireland uh, from the Digital Repository of Ireland. Um, so a few, I don't see any other main comments. Feel free to put any other comments you have in there. Uh, Barton highlights the moving from ideas to actions. It's so hard. Um, whether it's in our within our organizations where the team we work with day to day are trying to figure out how to move things along, or whether you're trying to uh, get down to those kernels or gems in this particular conversation. Um, another comment about the size of the group. The groups go up and down in terms of the number of folks that can join. I saw 20-ish in one and uh, seven in another. Um, typically in a face-to-face, -face, you have a little bit less of the uh, moving in and out. Um, but um, yeah, I'm not surprised uh, to see that. Um, so, okay, so a few comments there. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna, so while I was kind of responding to some colleagues and, um, uh, and we can talk about that. There's a few questions coming in about the Pecha Kucha, but I like 
Mike Smith's comment about rock, paper, scissors, always a good, uh, always a good choice. Um, so what I did while folks were in the, the second breakout is I created, uh, in my case, I only did 10 slides. I did one slide for each of the 10 themes that colleagues were uh, discussing today. So I'm just going to go ahead and pull out a few of the kernels or the bits and pieces that I pulled out of the, uh, the group notes. And just so that you get an appreciation for how this will work uh, moving forward, uh, the RDC team will actually take all of the content that people create. So that includes your, your group notes, any of the stuff in the Scratch space, uh, the Zoom chats, all of that content will be kind of pulled together and we'll try to extract uh, the specific actions and well, ideas, the background piece, uh, and then the actions uh, that came from that. Um, so this is my first slide, uh, which is all about open science. <laughs> and I think uh, a lot of you would be justified in trying to wonder what carrots have to do with open science. Uh, one of my favorite, so one of the things that I often hear, it's probably one of the most common terms in our, in our organizations, especially, I especially heard it quite frequently in the university context was we need carrots instead of sticks, or we need, uh, you know, we need a stick in this context because the carrots aren't working. So I tend, so in the open science context, one of the most common bits of discussion in the documents and in other contexts is the incentives that researchers have to engage in open science practices. What's in it for researchers uh, in terms of sharing their data? And when I do the closing keynote on Wednesday, I'll mention a, a session, a webinar that I went to last week that is uh, a monthly series of webinars from uh, academic societies about different aspects of data management. And one of the colleagues in the session last week said, as a researcher, it's better for me if I hoard my data. Um, so that's, that's not an uncommon thing to hear. So what I, what, what I always think of when I hear the carrots and sticks piece is personal incentives are small carrots and institutional or public good incentives are big carrots. So for me, there is no such thing really as a stick. Where, uh, you know, we tend to think of a stick as something that impinges on my personal approach or the way I approach my, my work or my... Uh, you know, the academic freedom that researchers enjoy in the Canadian context. For me, when it comes to something like data sharing and using open science practices, it's all about carrots that are in the public good and carrots that reflect the personal good. Uh, so that, uh, to me, was one kernel I pulled out of the uh, conversation of uh, the first two groups. Um, this next one is uh, the, top, the theme was reuse. So each of the groups A and B had the, uh, the topic was uh, reuse, uh, open science and reuse. Um, so one of the threads I pulled out of the reuse notes that were in the, um, the Google documents was just the sheer complexity of the different disciplines. Um, and this came out in the training uh, conversation as well. And that is that what is really needed is domain-specific training, uh, domain-specific knowledge. So helping researchers understand how to ensure that something like reuse can happen uh, is, is, a, is, a, is an important thing, but ultimately is extremely complicated and especially complicated by the differences between the domains. Uh, the next one is Sorry, getting my slides to advance here. Um, does anybody want to put in the chat what this person is doing? For all of those who have been to PEI. Um, great, thanks, Peter. Uh, a fellow Maritimer. <laughs> so um, 
and as one person who tried a few times to shuck oysters and ended up sticking the oyster shucker in my belly, um, it's a very difficult thing to do. <laughs> And one that you ideally should get training on before you uh, take it on. So this, uh, this, it's, it's very hard. It's very hard. Uh, but once I learned how to do it, it's, uh, it's much easier. So this is the, uh, the training theme. Um, the, the, some of the threads that came from the conversations in the documents, more researchers need to be involved in not just the uh, receiving training, but in the development of training, uh, creation of modular self-paced training, training for graduate students. A lot of these things we've heard. Uh, training to reflect disciplinary and, pro and process specific needs. Um, so a lot of great ideas about training. And I think training is one of those concepts that runs throughout a lot of the themes that you'll touch on. Uh, in your different breakout groups, and it just pops up everywhere, not just in the data management context, but in any context that we uh, that we consider. So that training piece is important, and we want to make sure researchers have uh, that appropriate training so that they don't hurt themselves shucking oysters. Um, this one was interesting for me. It was this uh, was the second theme. So a lot of the groups hadn't really had a lot of time to get deep into the this theme this is uh, the planning theme and what i found interesting and it may partly because it emerged from the previous uh conversations in terms of training and and the rest but one of the themes that came front and center here was intellectual property uh and the challenge of uh of uh the intersection between intellectual property and the material property of data or as uh, folks in our legal, legal colleagues will, will say, I mean, you can copyright some things, but you can't copyright facts. Um, so the way that a lot of researchers uh, um, manage their data, because it, the typical data set can't be copyright, is that they control their data. And the way, one way to control that data is by not uh, making it openly accessible. So that's a really important concept in terms of uh, a lot of researchers' plans for how they approach a particular research project. Um, and uh, in terms of when uh, that, uh, how they uh, undertake to reflect their intellectual property or the ownership of the data uh, and uh, how they reconcile uh, the fact that um, in an open data context, uh, that becomes a, a little bit more challenging. Another interesting contact mention that was made here was that the VP research and innovation uh, needs to be front and center in the conversation around planning. Uh, and that planning, uh, I know when I was at the University of Prince Edward Island, we worked very closely with the VP research to try to insert a data management planning process in front of any uh, researchers uh, submission for funding so that the institution was able to try and get a better sense of what that uh, research project would do. Uh, the next theme is sustainability. A lot of good threads, a couple of very uh, good detailed notes around sustainability. <clears throat> One of the things that you may not expect to have seen in this conversation around sustainability was a focus on persistent identifiers uh, and how, uh, you know, the simple fact that unless a persistent identifier is associated um, with the assets in the research ecosystem, then that sustainability uh, piece becomes much more challenging. Uh, also some mention of, uh, of the archiving gap uh, and the fact that it's hard to have sustainable research data when there is no strong mandate from any corner of the ecosystem for uh, archiving data. Um, and a few other uh, notes that came out in that piece. Uh, this one is metadata. <clears throat> this is a fairly common phrase. If, you're, if you uh, jump around in the metadata communities, metadata is a love note to the future without an appropriate metadata record. And this again would apply to sustainability of the data as well. 
uh, then it's challenging to uh, to do anything uh, with that data and ensure that it's fair and uh, and accessible. Um, the second last uh, theme was international partnerships. Um, the Research Data Alliance was mentioned in a couple of the, the groups, uh, leveraging existing uh, activities and resources like those that come out of the Research Data Alliance. Um, so I think the, uh, and interestingly enough, a lot of the, the, the quick scan I took of the notes on international partnerships highlighted the need for strong communication in the national context in order to facilitate uh, international partnerships. So I think when I looked at the notes for the groups as their, their discussion was, was evolving, I think it was focused on the national conversation uh, in, before they turned that around into the uh, international. And then uh, the last one is deposit. Uh, maybe there are two after this. And with apologies for the, the pile of coal, um, the, uh, the deposit conversation, I've, I dropped into a fascinating conversation around deposit in intersecting with publishers uh and uh, domains of uh communities of practice uh and the the challenge that the group was having was how do you how do you define publisher in this context are we talking about scholarly journal publishers or data publishers um so uh, one of the comments i made was to turn it around into what again uh, the group thought would be the important actions that could be taken to ensure that deposit uh, was easier for researchers. And one example that was raised was the publisher, a traditional academic journal publisher, doesn't need to publish the data, but they can become a mediator and be the, uh, you know, the middle, the mid, uh, the middleware between the journal submission process and determining what's the best uh, place to store your data. Uh, so that was actually quite an interesting conversation when I dropped in. Uh, this is the second last slide now. Uh, governance was the conversation. Governance, to my mind, for most people, is probably the hardest of the themes that ran through uh, the breakouts um, for today uh, and the, the ones that we'll see further down the road. Uh, governance is a tough one because a lot of people don't think of it. I mean, we sit on committees, uh, we participate on boards, uh, but how do you make sure that voices not generally heard at the governance table are heard? And having a seat at the governance table isn't always uh, necessarily the best answer. Uh, so the challenge here is how do we make sure for example, in an organization like Andrio that has a board uh, and a researcher council as you know, two of the kind of key governance bodies, and how do we facilitate uh, the opportunity to hear from other members of the stakeholder community like uh, publishers, domains of practice, uh, funders, and the rest. And then the last one was standards. Um, I didn't get a chance to look at the, the comments from uh, the group breakout groups that were considering the context of standards, uh, but I think if we think of almost any uh, kind of appliance or device that we use um, and take it for granted uh, without standards, uh, there would be no such thing as a Microsoft Windows or Mac OS on top of a piece of hardware. So I think that idea of standards is such a, a core part of the data management ecosystem and context. To some degree, it's, it's like governance. It's hard to maybe to articulate uh, how one moves the standards interest forward in the context of the different stakeholders uh, to facilitate this. Um, so that was my, my go at um, the... Uh, an example of a of a pecha kucha. So I'll just pause there to see if any of the groups or anybody wants to add any comments to the mix there before I do a little bit of a summary of how the pachakuchas are going to work tomorrow.
just just out of interest by putting in a b or c or cohort a b or c how many people have identified a person to deliver Pecha Kucha tomorrow i know of at least one there's one group cohort e i see somebody's shaking their head so <laughs> we have a couple And I see cohort J has put the slides together, but the moderator is taking the hit. Way to go, Felicity. Yeah, that's the challenge of being a moderator. So we have a few that have uh, started the movement forward. Um, so the one thing that I would encourage you to do, and I realized uh, that some of you are going to have to go um, fairly soon, but one of the things that we did decide to do was to keep the um, the day two uh, Pecha Kucha piece open, um, to keep the uh, the Zoom breakout room open. So we are you are able to continue to gather here in the general plenary room and in your breakouts uh, for the next hour. Um, I would suggest that if you get a few people together, actually creating a slide deck. Uh, with the, the slides and the images is not going to take much more than 15 or 20 minutes. Um, I know in my case, I use uh, the Creative Commons find content just because it makes it easy to provide an attribution. Uh, but there are other ways uh, to do that as well. Um, So it looks like we have one, two, three, four. But it looks like we have about five uh, Pitch Kucha presenters. So that's pretty good. Um, and uh, so I would encourage, uh, we'll leave some, maybe some extra time uh, once I'm wrapped up here that uh, people can go back into your breakouts and chat about the Pachakuchas. Um, so in terms of the, um, let me uh, get out of here and I'm going to share my Pecha Kucha deck. So every cohort uh, Google document has a link to the main deck uh, in your, in your collaborative Google document. It's at the top. Um, so I'll just share my screen and show what that looks like. Uh, sorry, give me a sec here. So this is the, uh, the deck for cohort A. And you'll notice um, there's a uh, a set of links at the top. Uh, link number five is the link to the Pechacucha deck. Um, and that deck looks like this. So as you can see, I don't want to steal Group A's thunder, but uh, Group A has started adding slides. So as I go down, so first of all, there's some instructions here. Uh, I also put a link into some sample uh, Pecha Kuchas. Uh, so there, oops, this, this is incorrect. That's supposed to be 15 slides of 20 seconds each. I changed it in my slide deck, but not here. So this has been pre-prepared. So group A, for example, is the theme open science. And there are 15 slides. Um, so the task uh, is to fill in the slides uh, with either a word or an image and uh, go ahead and add those in. And then tomorrow, each of the speakers uh, will go through that automatically advancing deck. So it will advance every 20 seconds on each of those 15 slides. And the challenge for Chantal and Melissa and myself will be orchestrating that smoothly. 
So if I go down, so cohort B has the theme reuse. Cohort C is training. So as we go down through the deck, you can see that each uh, cohort has a theme assigned and some of the cohorts have started adding some content. So uh, Chantal, I can't remember if people can unmute themselves. So at this point in time, I would say, feel free to unmute yourself if you have questions or ask questions in the chat. They can unmute themselves, Mark. Okay. So you can unmute yourself. So feel free to do so and make a comment, ask a question. Or put it in the chat. Um, hello, this is Carly. Hi, Carly. Uh, yeah, okay. Just, uh, I, I'm, I'm a bit confused. Like in our breakout topics, we have four topics. And, uh, uh, but our Pachakacha uh, is on like, just one of the two, one of the four topics. Is that correct? Like, uh, it is. Okay. But in the interests of uh, not trouncing over one of the rules I suggested to you at the beginning, feel free to be creative. <laughs> and if you uh, if you're having a hard time finding slides for theme metadata, uh, and your group is doing another one. You can pick that. The reason why the 10 themes that are in there are there is because those are the 10 themes that are discussed today in the breakouts. So for example, both breakout cohorts A and B both had the discussion of open science as a theme. So cohort A has open science. And then the other topic that each of cohorts A and B had was reused. So cohort B has reused. And the reason I did that was because there would have been some discussion of today's themes, which would facilitate uh, adding the slides and the like. Does that help, Carly? Yes. Yes. No. I know what's going on a bit better. Thank you. But I mean, I would I would say that if there is somebody in the group that wanted to sing a sea shanty, that the group would be quite happy to hear it, whether it was on the topic or not. Um, so as I said, I think I would leave the flexibility up to your individual cohorts and speakers as to how you approach that. Uh, Uh, Ming Lu asks if the cohort presentation has a limit to the stakeholders that are assigned. No. Um, the only uh, the only walls around the Pechacucha is the theme. That was the, uh, as I said, the easy way to give people a starting point in, in their discussion because they would have had a conversation around uh, that theme for sure. Uh, another question, could cohort G members come back to the breakout room to work on slides together? Absolutely. As I said, the, the breakout rooms will be open for the next hour. So if groups did want to, uh, <laughs> did want to take some time to do a little more cajoling to who's going to do the Pechacucha or work on the slides, your, that opportunity is there. Um, you can also uh, bear in mind that the uh, presentation will be, the slide deck will be shown in presentation mode. So you're more than welcome to add speaker notes um, to the deck or, you know, probably more or easier would be to have speaker notes uh, local to yourself written down or otherwise accessible. Yes, Peter. So the, the words or images um, in a in traditional Pechacucha context, the images or the words are partly there to help the speaker position themselves. Um, 
So, you know, what is, what is it that you want to talk about in that, in that part of the slide and what would help you as a speaker do that, but also obviously something that might help uh, evoke the context as you suggest. Any other comments or questions? So I would also encourage you to send uh, comments, uh, email to me directly. Uh, I'm going to stay logged into Zoom. I'll be in the plenary channel. So if you have any kind of further comments or questions, then let me know. Um, the first time giving this approach a try. Um, so any additional uh, helpful comments are appreciated. Uh, otherwise, I would say, unless I can see anything else that folks are asking. So I see a few people suggesting uh, that folks will meet back in the breakout. Um, so feel free to do that. As I said, I'm going to suggest that uh, we bring uh, the day one event to a close. And uh, I appreciate everybody uh, participating and uh, we will see you back tomorrow morning uh, for the Pecha Kuchas.